Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, an experiment that we've recently uh, published, uh, which we've entitled a, a gravitational analog to uh, the aeronaut bohm effect. And then I want to speculate on how that might uh, have some uh, impact on how we think about the superpositions of Newtonian gravitational fields. So uh, just by way of quick introduction, <laughs> we, we know that there's uh, quantum interference happens with electrons. Uh, beautiful experiment by Tanamura. And what may not be universally known to all in the uh, audience is that that is also the case uh, with uh, atoms. And back in uh, 91, Jurgen Linick did uh, kind of the field opening experiment for my subfield in atomic physics uh, with uh, where he realized the Young's double slit experiment for uh, a metastable uh, helium atom beam. And the way, the way it worked is beam of atoms illuminates the first narrow slit. Uh, the atom wave front, de Broglie wave diffracts from that first slit and coherently illuminates two more slits. These are the de Broglie waves, and those two slits now become two sources of propagating de Broglie waves that interfere on a screen, and the interference is reflected by a um, you know, pattern of where you uh, count the atoms. And they had a detector uh, that they scanned across the interference fringe, you know, it counted uh, with some... It was a very low count rate, hundreds of counts in a five-minute window, but they saw crenellations in that pattern that was just like what you would have expected for uh, the Young's double slit experiment. So that was the experiment that opened uh, the atom interferometry subfield. And you know, prior to this experiment, there was a lot of uh, chatter in the literature. Uh, people wrote papers that like, okay, of course, quantum mechanics works, but you're never ever going to see uh, you know quantum superposition of atoms in a trajectory such that you could. Uh, build a de Broglie wave interferometer, and uh, kind of the, the, the nature of the objections weren't fundamental, but technological, like you're never going to control the magnetic field gradients, or you know, there's going to be too many vibrations. And what happened was uh, you know, just technology progressed to the point where this type of apparatus could build. Uh, OK, so fast forward to uh, 2015. This is data coming out of my group now. Uh, we're building, uh, we have since 91, you know, a history of de Broglie wave interference, and we're building uh, atom de Broglie interferometers that are based on a somewhat different topology. Uh, we use the so-called uh, Max Zender topology, where you, 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 you split up a, 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 a clump of atoms, uh, you redirect them with mirrors, and then you overlap them and, and, and recombine them and look at uh, the interference fringe. And uh, what I'm showing you here is some data taken when the atom wave packets are midway through the interferometer. And what was uh, a holy grail for us at the time was that uh, the separation between those two clumps of atoms, and okay, each clump of atoms has, is about 10 to the 5 atoms, and each atom is, in, I claim, in a coherent superposition of two spatial uh, states separated by uh, half a meter, which is like from here to here. And you say, like, okay, well, <laughs> it's pretty easy to make a superposition, but prove it to me, that's where it gets tough. I can take a beam splitter and make a Schrodinger cat, and then, you know, but I, I don't know if it's going to be coherent or not. Uh, so we have to have some way of bringing the uh, superposed wave packets back together and seeing if we saw interference fringe. And so uh, this is the data I'm showing you here. Uh, on the left is kind of the schematic of the uh, apparatus. I will show you the real apparatus in a few slides, but suffice to say, right, what we do in this apparatus, we start with a, 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 a cluster of atoms. We use laser cooling methods, and this is all done in ultra-high vacuum so that you can think of the atoms propagating but not really colliding with much else. Uh, and we have a, a, a vacuum tube, which is about 10 meters tall, and we, we start with the source of atoms. We launch this clump of atoms up this tube, and you can think of the atoms like a, a fistful of grains of sand or something. And as they are propagating up the tube, we uh, hit the atoms with a series of light pulses. I'll say a little bit more about this in a second. And that series of light pulses is engineered in such a way that we coherently uh, divide, redirect, and recombine uh, the, the, wave, the wave packets associated with each one of those atoms, which is about 10 to 6 atoms in, in the ensemble. And then after this pulse sequence, again, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of the detail in a, in a, in a second. Uh, we have output ports of the interferometer. That's, that's kind of shown on the, the lower uh, left of the screen. And those output ports are labeled by uh, different momenta. And so literally what happens is clusters of atoms in one output port re, you know, enter I mean, are one region of space. Clusters in another output port are a different region of space. 
And uh, we monitor the interference range just by turning on a laser beam that fluoresces the atoms, and where you see atoms, you see light, and you image that light on a, uh, where there are atoms, you see light, and you image that light on a, a CCD detector. So you, by looking at the, uh, uh, the, the scattered light on the, on, the, on the detector, you see where the atoms are. Uh, you're basically measuring their wave function, and you can see what the, uh, the, the interference uh, has uh, patterns, how they've been manifested. And so what I'm showing you in the, in the false color diagrams are uh, images of uh, atoms and, uh, at the two output ports, and the manifestation of interference is uh, when the, uh, the number of atoms at a given output port swings from one of the output ports to the other output port, depending on the relative phase of the interfering uh, atom beams. And so, uh, for example, on the, the lower right, if you look at the noisy data, that's where we separated the wave packets by 54 centimeters. We did not take the picture, because otherwise we would have gotten the which path information. Instead, we bring them back together. Uh, when the wave packets overlap, they interfere. And depending on the relative phase of the interference, uh, you either see the atoms at one output port or the other output port. Now, things didn't work perfectly. If, if this was an ideal world, we would have had perfect suppression of uh, atom in one port and all the atoms within the other port for one phase and for the other, you know, the constructively interfering phase and for the uh, destructively interfering phase would be the other way around. There's always, a, a, you know, some, some atoms that didn't quite interfere perfectly. But nonetheless, there's the oscillation in the population between those ports that is, you know, like the smoking gun signature that we have uh, coherence between those two ensembles of atoms that are separated by a half meter. Now, to put that in like classical terms, <clears throat> with just this is a misleading argument, but you know, I, I, bear with me. <laughs> if, if the atom is a golf ball, uh, then the, uh, the, the the sort of the scale of this experiment would be equivalent to taking that atom, dividing it in two quantum mechanically, sending one part of the golf ball to the moon, and then bringing it back, and then uh, you know, kind of overlapping the wave function of that golf ball in such a way uh, that we we see the sort of uh, interference effect which is to say that the first time we did this experiment didn't work. And there are lots of, lot, lots of effects that had to be controlled in order to get to the point where we're looking at uh, that kind of uh, wave function interference. The data on the left side, which is like, it, you know, looks perfect in comparison, that was our calibration trace. It showed that we had the opportunity to do good interference when we didn't separate the wave packets or the wave functions by as much as 54 centimeters. For that data, it was just a couple centimeters, 1.52 centimeters, I should say. Uh, if you want to go under the hood, uh, this is what we do. So right after we prepare an ensemble of atoms, they're ultra cold, temperatures down around uh, uh, microkelvin to a couple hundred nanokelvin, and temperature is just a loose way of talking about uh, the, the RMS velocity spread of the atomic ensemble. That RMS velocity spread is, um, you know, below a kind of a millimeter per second. So these atoms, after they've been prepared, they really just don't want to spread out that much, unlike the atoms in this room that, you know, like running around at kilometers per second. And then we uh, have, with laser manipulation techniques, we, we have a way of taking the atoms that were prepared at rest, launching them vertically with uh, about 13 meters a second worth of velocity so that they climb uh, the gravitational potential and then fall back down in, in, the, in the evacuated tube. And as they're doing that, we go and we, we hit the, the, the clouds of atoms with a series of laser pulses. And the pulses are designed to uh, transfer momentum between the light beam and uh, the atom de Broglie waves. And uh, the momentum transfer happens in a quantized way, two photon recoil with every pulse of light we apply, and we're using stimulated Bragg transitions to accomplish this. And uh, basically, what we do is we start with one pulse of light, it's like a, that, that serves as a brag rating. It's, it's intensity and time and duration are chosen so that we create a linear superposition of two different momentum states. So that was, that's the defining creation point for the superposition. And then uh, we do just kind of like what Feynman suggests in his uh, Chapel Hill uh, <laughs> you know, thought experiment for separating you know, like kilogram masses. We, we amplify that superposition, that was his words, and, and by a, a, a sequence of laser pulses that take that initial small momentum uh, difference between the, the two superposed wave packet and turn it into a big momentum difference. And we, we do that just by 
kicking one of the arms with a, a sequence of uh, momentum recoil inducing transitions so that the relative momenta between the interfering wave packets ultimately is uh, on the order of a meter per second. And we let the wave packets go their way for on the order of a second. We come in with another sequence of pulses. We change the, the momentum of the wave packets so that they head back towards one another. And then uh, eventually, uh, with even more pulses, we get them to be almost at rest so that a final beam splitting pulse can accomplish the interference. And then we look what we got. So it's just a bunch of light pulses that accomplish this. And the, the way we maintain the coherence is uh, basically we're transferring the, the coherence of the de Broglie waves. It's all traces back to the spectacular coherence properties of modern lasers. If the, if the, the, the laser has a very stable wavelength and that results in stable momentum transfer and that allows us to control the relative the velocities of these two interfering arms, bringing them back together so that we can observe the interference. Okay. The, um, for, we, we, this, is, this is actually real. So that's, that's our apparatus, and I, I, I'm not going to tell you the details of it, but it uh, took about a decade to build, uh, and there's vacuum pumps and power supplies and all those unmentionals. It's about 10 meters, 10 meters tall. Yes, yeah, it's, it's in a pit in the, the basement of uh, the, the building I occupy. Yeah. Low vibration and all the rest. Yeah. Uh, so when you build an interferometer, uh, the first thing you're, you're happy to see is that you have some interference, and we were happy to see that. But then you, uh, like, you usually build an interferometer to measure something. And so uh, say, well, what is this thing sensitive to? And it turns out, like, it's spectacularly sensitive to inertial forces. And so you uh, go back, and people have been calculating the sensitivity of the Broly wave interferometer to inertial forces since the, the, the mid-'80s. Uh, and you can go and do the, the simple phenomenology. It's nothing more than solving Schroeder equation, and uh, you can look at the sensitivities to say a uniform gravitational field or a rotation or so forth. And so in the simplest approximation, and kind of the part of the, part of the point of this talk is I'm gonna go well beyond this simple approximation in a few slides. But in the simplest approximation, uh, the phase shift you uh, learn that exists between the interfering wave packets when they've flown up this tube, been redirected by light beams and come back down and, and interfere, uh, it turns out that for one G worth of acceleration, which is like what we have in our lab, <laughs> uh, you see about 10 to the 10 radians worth of phase, relative phase, evolve between the, the interfering wave packets. And that, that large number of uh, radians is a, a measure of just how good you can be at resolving very small changes uh, in the acceleration due to gravity. From the point of view of this talk, I want to uh, just point out that that, that simple expression, that simple-minded expression, does not depend on what? I mean, I'm supposed to be doing some amazing quantum thing, but uh, I don't see Planck's constant in there, and I don't see the mass of the atom. All right, now, actually, uh, I think that's what I should have expected, uh, except if I read the neutron interference literature from, <laughs> uh, I have words to say about that towards the end of the talk. Uh, if you look at the interference expressions that appear for the textbook treatment of the Koal-Overhauser and Werner experiment, you, you actually see a different parameterization that involves Planck's constant and, and you know, a, a bunch of uh, other factors that, that actually seem to violate the equivalence principle. <laughs> because, heck, I got an atom in a gravitational field that's falling. Does, should the interference fringe depend on the mass of the atom if I'm a believer in the equivalence principle? Well, I, I don't think so. And the way, to, the way to see that is if I go into uh, uh, a freely falling frame, I freely fall at the atom, it's, you know, it's a uniform gravitational field. I mean, I shouldn't be able to detect that field at all. So I, I, I really wouldn't expect to see a mass-dependent uh, phase shift here at all. And that's good for us because what we want to do with this is make a test of the equivalence principle. And ask the question, this has just been kind of a long-standing goal for my group for a, a decade, and uh, we finally got around to publishing this uh, result in COVID, which you know, was not probably the best time to re release the result. But uh, what we've done in this experiment is create two ensembles of wave packets, Ribidium 85, Ribidium 87, different mass structure, right? We launch them up this tube, they, they fly up, they come back down, we hit them with the interferometer, interferometer pulses, exact same laser pulses for both isotopes. Uh, we measure the interference fringes simultaneously, 
and our expectation is, although we're unbiased by the expectation, we're just like, what is that interference supposed to look like? And you know, then we compare with what our, our, the, the simple theory should tell us. Uh, we, we measure the relative phases of the interferometer outputs for the rubidium 85 and the rubidium 87. And we, we see if there's any, we want to learn, is there a differential phase shift? If there is, that's a violation of the equivalence principle in, in our way of thinking about it. And so what does the data look like? Well, it's, uh, look on the right, uh, those are the two output ports of the rubidium 85 interferometer and the rubidium 87 interferometer. <clears throat> and what you're kind of doing when you do the data analysis is you're looking to see if the fringe peaks and valleys stack up with respect to one another. If there's no phase shifts, whenever you see a null in the 87, you're gonna see a null in the 85 and vice versa. Uh, okay, so <laughs> there's a lot that goes into acquiring the data, lots of chops and switches and things that experimentalists love to talk about. I just don't have time to do that here. Uh, but suffice to say that for you know, large set of data uh, acquired under the appropriate different conditions, we observe essentially a, a null phase shift between those two isotopes. And to put that in, uh, so there's the raw data. Horizontal axis is uh, you know, which measurement number I'm talking about. A measurement is load the atoms in a trap, launch them through the apparatus, pile on the pulse sequence, detect them, measure the differential phase, and repeat. It takes about 30 seconds to do that. We do that hundreds or thousands of times, accumulate statistics. Uh, here's the result. Uh, Lots of system, so in a precision measurement type of discussion, I have to tell you about all the different ways that I could get the wrong answer and how I've, you know, what we've done to uh, mitigate those so-called systematic errors. And so most of them are associated with kinematic misalignments of the atom clouds as they f fly through the apparatus if they have different velocities than you thought or different positions that's gonna give you fake equivalence principle signals. You might think the EP is violated when it was just because the atom clouds had like different velocity than you thought they should have. Uh, and the bottom line is we test the equivalence principle here at about the part in 10 to the 12 level. And uh, we're excited about that. This is the like setting a record for an atom-based, uh, I could say quantum system test of the equivalence principle. I'm looking at how atomic wave packets, uh, you know, free fall, and I, I'm showing you here operationally that Rubidium 85 and Rubidium 87 free fall at the same rate. Okay, so then you say, well, yeah, all those other better experiments out there using more classical methods, you know, do we have a chance of competing with them? And you start thinking about the next generation, they're two orders of magnitude better than this data, by the way, the uh, sat recent satellite experiments. So, so like, what do we gotta do to get to the next level, take it to the next level? And you start thinking about, some of the basic assumptions that go behind that phase shift. Like, uh, I told you that phase shift was not surprising to me because it only depended on kinematics because it was a uniform gravitational field. Uh, you say, well, how uniform actually does the gravitational field have to be? Like, in my apparatus, at some level, there are warts in the gravitational field. There's, there's, <laughs> there's curvature. And when do I start to be sensitive to that in a test of the equivalence principle? Sensitivity would mean I would start to see mass-dependent phase shifts creep into the phenomenology. That would, again, be like fake signals of a, of, of a violation of the equivalence principle. So it turns out there's uh, some, some literature that, lots of papers out there. Some of the, my favorites are the, uh, well, my favorite is the one by Christian Bourdais going back to 2013, where he proves this thing he calls the midpoint theorem, which basically, uh, is, it is a mathematically rigorous treatment of the, the idea that in uniform or actually you can have second order, uh, you can have a linear gradient in the potential or second order uh, uh, curvature, you can, that, that, that's good enough to adopt a kinematic, a kinematic model for the phase shift where you know, the phenomenology is just reflected by the motion of the freely falling diffraction wave fronts of the atom with respect to the reference phase fronts of your laser phase. And you can think of this, this experiment, if you want to, I want to talk about it in a quantum way to you, but really that, uh, that'd be disingenuous. What's, what's kind of going is, I'm thinking of the atoms as marbles, they're falling under the influence of gravity, and I'm laser tracking the distance of the marbles with the laser beams I'm using to uh, open and close that, those interferometer loops. And 
In the end, that can be summarized by this thing that we call the midpoint theorem, which is nothing more than the phase shift is the relative kinematics between the lasers and the atoms. Okay, but then you say, I think I got more than second order in the, in the gravitational field. And so what does the phase shift start to look like? And so then uh, you can, I mean, it amounts to integrating Schrodinger equation. And what you find is that when you start to have third order uh, curvature there, that you start to get mass dependent phase shifts. And so what I want to tell you now is a story about those high order phase shifts and how they map onto uh, the gravitational uh, aeronaut bohm effect. So this is the experiment that we just published, and uh, it's the following. We, we on purpose made a high curvature situation for the atom to bullet waves in the, in the following way. We have our interferometer, and we make uh, the interference wave packets of one of the interferometers fly near this tungsten proof, a tungsten proof mass. And uh, when it flies near that tungsten proof mass, well, it does see a lot of gravitational field from that proof mass. And the wave packets that are further away, it's hard to see. This is uh, uh, these little dots on, on, in that kind of thing, which I mean to be the laser beam. Uh, the, one of the dots is right in the middle of the tungsten proof mass. The other dot is 25 centimeters away, which was this wave packet separation we were using uh, in this experiment. One of them is strongly coupled to that proof mass. The other one is less strongly coupled to the proof mass gravitationally. By coupling, I say we can just you know, understand that in terms of the Newtonian gravitational potential between the, 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 the atom in a given location and the tungsten. What's, what's the mass of the tungsten? It's about a kilogram. A one kilogram. Wow. Yeah, the question is, what's the mass of the tungsten? It's about a kilogram. Uh, you might ask, why is it a semicircular <laughs> rather than a full circle of tungsten? Well, we just couldn't fit the full circle in our apparatus. So, uh, which that gives us a little bit of a complication, but uh, it's manageable. There's a second interferometer in this problem. <laughs> there's a, there's a, 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 another interferometer that is displaced much further from that tungsten. And what that is basically doing is defining an inertial reference for the experiment. Everything's free falling in the, the field of the Earth, and we just want to see what is the influence of the tungsten. So what we do is we reference one interferometer to the other interferometer. Both interferometers are free falling, but one of them sees the tungsten, the other one kind of doesn't. And this also is important for us because it, it, it takes out technical noise associated with uh, laser uh, phase fluctuation. So let's go into the freely falling frame. And I'm, I'm almost at the point where I can show you some data. So in the freely falling frame, what does the atom in the upper interferometer see? Well, it's, it's, it's wave packets separate. And we, we really do do a kind of a pulse sequence that gives us this diamond-shaped interferometer. As they separate by 25 centimeters in the freely falling frame, the, the atom sees <laughs> this tungsten mass fly towards it at 10 meters per second squared, turn around, and fly away. It, it, I mean, it sees like an impulse of gravitational potential. And then, uh, you know, it may be deflected and whatnot. And eventually, the, 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 the rolling waves come back together and interfere. And I got the question, like, what is the phase associated by that interference? So I claim that this is, you're saying I got five minutes left. Yeah, OK, and I, I got five minutes left. Uh, I say this is very analogous to what happens in the electric aeronaut bohm effect. And in the electric aeronaut bohm effect, let me remind you, you have an electron coming into a beam splitter. Beam splitter creates two beams of electrons. The beams fly through Faraday cages. When they're in the Faraday cages, you pulse on an electric field. Uh, my analogy is the tungsten mass is flying down and pulsing on the, the, the gravitational uh, uh, potential. Uh, they come out of the Faraday cages, they overlap, and they interfere. And what's amazing about this setup is, uh, for sure, there's a change in the energy when the Faraday cages are pulsed on. I pulse, I pulse on a voltage. I, I have a change in energy for an electron in there, E times V. I get, a, by simple quantum mechanics, a phase shift uh, that I can read out when I, I look at the uh, output ports of the interferometer. But what we all love about this quantum mechanics is there's no force on the electron. You know, there's negligible forces, and there's a huge literature on whether those negligible forces are really important. There's really not a lot of force on that electron. 
and yet there's a large phase shift. Like, this seems like a, a very quantum mechanical effect. And there's a, a lot of literature written about gauge and this and that, about how to, how to understand this. Uh, I just want to take a, a you know, kind of maybe a simplified view, a experimentalist simplification in discussing this, and I'll, I'll get there uh, in just a moment. But what's, what's critical in aronov bohm theory is that the relative phase between the interfering wave packets is given by an action integral difference between the two interfering arms. And uh, it turns out you can have that action difference without imparting a force, a force on, on the electron. Okay, so here's our data. And what I'm doing here, the, the, the uh, x-axis is basically, uh, by adjusting the timing of the laser pulses, I can adjust the height that, that the interferometer approaches the uh, tungsten mass. And I, so I can kind of change that coupling uh, for the, one of the interferometer arms. And I can measure the phase shift. And then I can compare that against theory. And like, I can do the theory, I just solve Schrodinger equation. But what's amazing is, I can also do the theory for, uh, you know, like using the midpoint theorem, or just uh, the theory, if I only assumed that the phase shift was due to forces that were deflecting the atom wave packets. Is that, I mean, oftentimes when we talk about the Broglie wave interference, we're like, oh, I understand what's going on there. It's just there's a force on the wave, it changes its velocity, it changes the number of wiggles of the wave function, it changes the phase when everything comes back together and interferes. And uh, so if I use those models, I get the completely wrong phase shift. And that's what I show in the gray trace on that diagram. That's if you just do the phenomenology neglecting this kind of Aaron of Bohm uh, uh, gravitational action. If I do the full theory, I get you know, what we observe is consistent with that full theory. Now, if you go into, if you if you're, love Aronov Bohm literature and you've read those papers that say why these interpretations have been wrong for decades, Aronov Bohm, an original paper was in 59, it's always about, oh, there are fringe forces, things that you didn't think about when you were constructing your experiment that were giving some, some force that was just a you know, more conventional phase shift rather than this Aronov Bohm mechanism. Uh, so what we did in the experiment is we actually had a way of measuring the deflection-induced phase shifts. I'm running out of time, so I won't tell you how to do that, how we did that, but different type of interferometers let us characterize the deflection of the wave packets. And we can actually demonstrate that we could go to a place where the phase shift due to deflections was zero, and yet we still had a phase shift due to the interferometer, uh, you know, in the, the Erna Bohm operating condition. So you say, uh, how do I think about that? Everybody has their favorite ways of thinking about the Arnold Bohm uh, experiment. So this is something that's become increasingly appealing to me in uh, recent months. And I, I want you to think about energy and gravitational field. So what I have in this situation is, uh, oh, by the way, this argument does wonders when you think about the electric uh, versions of the Arnold Bohm effects, including the magnetic version, which I didn't talk about. But I have an atom. It's got, a, it's got a gravitational field associated with it. It's a tiny one, but it's, it's flying around with its, that, that center of mass wave function, anchored to it. Uh, I'm not considering radiation here. <laughs> so the, I, that's just the Coulomb field. If you were anchored to one atom and another side of the, the atom wave function. In principle, those Coulomb fields are in superposition, right? And those fields are overlapping with the field from the tungsten. And so by prescription of non-relativistic uh, gravitational physics, I can define a, uh, I, I can have a, a gravitational field energy, I can integrate that field energy over all space, and I can compute the energy that is in the gravitational field. I gotta subtract off the self-interaction terms and so forth. Uh, and that's, that's what I show you on the, the top equation. I can get the phase shift for the interferometer, and this is the phase shift that we observe and calculate, and it's, you know, nothing more than the phase shift given by Newtonian potential interacting on a wave function, uh, I can get the phase shift by taking the difference between those two energies. The energy of when one of the atom gravitational field is close to the tungsten and the other half of the wave function, it's the atom gravitational field is further away. It's, of course, in either one or the other. When they come back together, they overlap, they interfere, and I got the interference uh, value that uh, is predicted. So I, I say that this phase shift, this Aronov-Bohm phase shift, 
I'm pretty comfortable interpreting that as experimental evidence for superposition of, you know, non-relativistic superposition of uh, coherent states of gravitational fields. Uh, at this point, you might be saying, well, didn't we already see that in the Cow experiment? And I want to come back to the point that uh, in the neutron case, it was a uniform gravitational field. Uniform gravitational field is no gravitational field as far as I'm, considered, I'm, I'm concerned. There is no gravitational action in that Cow experiment. You gotta, okay, you gotta do the math and you find out that the kinetic energy change and the potential energy change all cancel out and the physical effect is due to the relative motion of the interferometer apparatus with respect to the de Broglie waves which are falling. That's where, that's where I would say that phase shift comes from. The uh, textbooks confuse you because they compute that using perturbation theory and they make you think that there's an action-based phase shift. It's not. So from this perspective, I would say, before this experiment, world has never seen, uh, experimentally, uh, the, the superposition of gravitational field of interfering objects in, you know, in this type of configuration. Uh, this is my almost last slide. <laughs> so we can take this a step third. Take this simple model a step third, further. There's all sorts of semi-classical models out there that say, hey, I can't do that superposition of gravitational field of the atom, right? And so uh, one way of ruling those in and out is to change the probability amplitude of the interfering wave packets. Like I can put, with, by changing my beam splitter parameters, I can put 25% of the probability amplitude in one arm, 75 in the other arm, or 50-50, or 75-25, and I can look. Do I have a different phase shift when I change those ratios? And the data is shown on the bottom there. To within our statistics, uh, we don't see a systematic shift, or a shift depending on the probability amplitude. So, you know, for your favorite phenomenology that's semi-classical, I say, confront this data with it. Uh, finally, I would say this is not just esoteric thinking. Like, these phase shifts really matter for us when we think about building the kind of devices that, like this one, where I, we want to put a gravity gradiometer in orbit and use it to measure the Earth's geopotential to look for, uh, you know, where the water table is, is going when the Greenland ice sheet melts. And if I don't have this phenomenology right, we get into regimes for the instruments we're building that are, are starting to be deep into that aeronaut bone regime, and for years we've been doing the phase shift kind of the wrong way. So we're kind of going back and doing some corrections to our calculation. But I, what I say is that this, this uh, thinking about quantum gravity here is directly impacting a, a technology that we're evolving right now. And this is my last slide. So coming back to uh, more theoretical musing, there's been a lot of talk about gravitationally entangled interferometers. So it's, in, in the experiment I just showed you, I had an interferometer and a static tungsten mass. And I showed you that I think I have evidence for a superposition of you know, fields in the way I described. Now in this gravitational entanglement experiment, I, I fly two interferometers next to each other, and there's a, their particles are massive enough so I have a Newtonian interaction between a pair of the arms, and uh, you can do the, the math and you end up getting entanglement between these wave functions. And that, that's manifest in the way you detect the, uh, the, the outputs of the interferometers. Now I would leave you with the following box pictures that are reminiscent of what Brigitte put up in, in, in her talk of earlier in the week. It's like, entanglement to me is nothing more than souped up superposition. Like once I buy into superposition, I'm wondering, is there much more when I start talking about entanglement? So I want to leave it as a question. What, what additional do we learn about superposed gravitational fields that I didn't already learn in the, the kind of superposed interpretation I just uh, gave you for our Aaron Bone work? Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. I want to talk to you about that. <laughs> um, I meant to be provocative. <laughs> right. For the uh, business members of the board, you just had a really important application sail by you a couple of minutes ago. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm now going to open the uh, session to discussion, initially of Mark's talk, but then of the entire conference. Okay? 
Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, pe so people can raise questions from pretty much anything that happened during the conference. And I believe that we're going to have to cut off just before five because there's a reception. Is that correct? Is it in the schedule? Is it five? I'm pretty sure. So just so you know, there is a reception with live music starting at five. And then for those people who are speakers in the meeting only, there will be the uh, last of Terry's uh, salons at 6.30. Correct? I think I got all the times right. OK. So questions, please. So thanks so much, Mark, and congratulations, as always. <laughs> it's amazing experiments. Um, this is more for my understanding to begin with, uh, the two things. First of all, um, the uh, initial comment on the mass dependence of the phase shift. Um, just to understand correctly, because you compared it with the original cow experiment, mm -hmm. where if you look in the original paper, there's a mass uh, and H bar, uh, H in that case, in the phase, um, which basically just, if I understand correctly, so this is, a, this is the question, it comes from the fact that instead of the K effective that you have in your expression, they basically just put one over the De Broglie wavelength, which of course mm -hmm. depends on the mass and uh, exactly. on, on the exactly. mass velocity and, and Planck's constant. Yes. So in that sense, you could also just rewrite your phase shift in terms of uh, instead of K effective, you pay, take two pi over the De Broglie wavelength. Correct. Okay. And, but then, then I would uh, maybe just uh, add on. It's like because you could say, well, okay, it can't really matter how we choose to parameterize equations. You know, what's, what really should be the significant attribute? And I would say, let's compute the gravitational action around the loops. Okay. Or, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, fa fair enough. You made it clear in the end. So the, the more important one, I guess, is um, the, what, what, what it takes to make the statement that you have um, the gravitational field superposition of the atoms. So basically uh, interpreting the phase shift that you see as a superposition of the gravitational field of the atoms. Doesn't that require to make the step that you interpret your experiment from the point of view of the atoms? So basically you're going in a reference frame, in a rest frame of the atoms. I, I would say so. I, okay. I mean, I would just do the, uh, you know, what we learned this morning, where it's like, let's put the Coulomb field associated with the atom next to the center of mass wave function, call that our the quantum state, and then go and uh, calculate field energy. Okay, f fair enough. So from that reference frame, I fully agree. Mm -hmm. that, but then wouldn't that as a consequence also mean if I go to any, yeah, so either your experiment, also the early interference experiments and so on, mm -hmm. um, that any time I go into a reference frame, um, uh, uh, so in, in the frame of the particle that is in a superposition, yeah. then from the particle's point of view, of course, the lab is also in, in a superposition. So using that argument, wouldn't I then also be able to say, well, I can have evidence that I can produce macroscopic superpositions of the size of my lab because I see interference in my atom interferometer? Well, I, so that is a very interesting and provocative statement. And I, I, so uh, this is tapping into the quantum reference showing literature. Exactly. And I think there is some merit for that. I, for me, uh, you know, I don't want to go f f full bore and say like, <laughs> the tungsten's in superposition. But what it, what it really drives home for me is that uh, this, what, what is in some of the literature is that the, the, this quote, we, I think Bob would recognize these words, like the, the relational nature of uh, GR, which is that, you know, I, if, I, if I think about G M1, M2 over R, I can write that as the potential of the big mass times the little mass. I can write that as the potential of the uh, little mass times the big mass. Or I can write that as this, this field energy expression. All those things are equivalent ways of, of expressing the, the, the kind of the same phenomenology. And then you have to pick and choose. And uh, if you're a picker and chooser that's interested in saying like, well, okay, I wanna, I, I'm just interested in the question, like can a gravitational field exist in superposition? Then you're always, there's a nice paper by Ravelli that says like, you know, okay, you can, you can just be a diehard and say, all I want is action at a distance between point particles. 
Yeah, okay, you're, you're, and you can also be a solipsist. <laughs> you, know, you, you can choose to say that words just all figments of your imagination in the stock. But you can, you, can, you can have a preferred view if you want of, that's my preferred view. I, I'm very comforted by the, 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 the symmetry of describing that interaction of, in, in terms of the, the gravitational field energy. Yeah. I share the confidence, I question the logic. <laughs> What's the logic? What's the logic problem? Say again. Oh, do you, you question the logic? Yeah, right. What, but, what, but I share the oh, confidence. No, I hate to be wrong in logic. That's the most embarrassing no, no. error I can make. Where's my logic wrong? <laughs> well, again, the argument, so I, um, but maybe I'm pushing it too, too far. So basically, if the question is, can I have superposition of macroscopic objects, so now independent of a gravitational field, so just the question, can I have superposition of a macroscopic object the size of my laboratory, then um, I can use the argument, um, uh, I, I think the same argument that you made would lead to a positive answer by saying, look, from the point of view of my, of my macromolecule, of, of, my, of my helium atom, the lab is in a superposition. No, okay, I, so great, I'm glad you asked that question. I, I brought up this relational character. That's a testable hypothesis now, all right? If there is an asymmetry, I mean, we, we know that it's gonna be more difficult and probably there's something to be tested there with larger masses. So I don't, I don't want to say that we don't do those experiments, if, if you will. I, I mean, I, I think that there's, there's a possibility, real possibility that physics may break down with those larger masses. And then if you say, well, what's the language I would use to say, what am I testing when I do that? I say, well, maybe I don't want to say I'm testing superposition because I think the superposition argument is solid, but I might be wanting to not go into the quantum reference frame. If, if right, right, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. testing this principle, yes, I agree. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hmm? Very interesting question. Ah, sorry, Slava. So, look, you use always the word macroscopic, microscopic, but how quantitatively you separate macroscopic from microscopic? Okay, 10 atoms is enough for you, 20 or 30 should be there. there is no any criteria which would allow us definitely say that it's macroscopic and this is microscopic. You see? Therefore, when we are measuring superposition principle, no, okay, why it should not be applicable to the same Schrodinger cat? Mm -hmm. Why Schrodinger cat is so special? Or some people, okay, like, as you know, Wheeler moved in fact, it was von Neumann first who moved this border where you make reduction of the state vector to the brains of the people. And Wheeler continued this tradition. Then you understand that there is actually, it becomes more and more hard to verify superposition principle when you add new, uh, how it's called, atoms there. Mm -hmm. But when you can say that you are 100% sure that quantum mechanics is applicable to everything. I can give you an example. Quantum mechanics is applicable to the whole universe. Why it should not be applicable to Schrodinger cat, okay? I could never understand actually this kind of logic. Well, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I, I if that's a comment. <laughs> I, I mean, that's, that's the quest, right? I mean, we, we, we await experimental input for that, would, would you say? So, Slava. And, and, and the measurement problem leaves us all head spinning, and this is where we love, I mean, that maybe Salon, you know, night three is our <laughs> measurement problem. But we, we all are still uncomfortable with that, right? That's what you were sort of just, I, I think, commenting on. No, and, I So, Slava, the answer to your question is really simple. If you believe that quantum mechanics applies to everything up to the universe, then of course you can say, what's the point of all of this? But lots of people don't, okay? And they are, they are anxious to find out whether or not quantum mechanics breaks down. And as Jim pointed out to you yesterday, it's a huge extrapolation from the regime where we know that quantum mechanics works, to the universe. 
So it's perfectly okay for you to simply assert that it works for the universe. But it should show it's really been proved. No, it hasn't been. <laughs> They'll be convinced when it's been demonstrated experimentally. Yeah, I, I maybe just wanted to be focused on the, the, the experiment that question I was interested in that answering, which was just in the context of gravity field with curvature and suitably space, spatially uh, delocalized wave function, could I use the mechanism of quantum mechanics to calculate the phase shift? Yeah. Of course, yeah, you know, that's, that's what my theory colleagues say at Stanford too, but I, I, I don't buy it. I know that's, we, we gotta go and we gotta look. That's what I'd say, but <laughs> he's not funding my research. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily we can detect water table shifts too. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the beauty of, of this work, and it really is remarkable, is that you can actually do these experiments, that they're not just a Duncan experiment, and that you can, you can, you can explore the gravitational um, Baumarinov effect, for instance. Um, but I want to ask, if, if one, in the spirit of Kip's extreme thought experiments, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, for instance, could, if you were to do a gravitationally coupled uh, Bohm-Marinov effect, say, just outside of a black hole, or someplace where there was extreme curvature, would you be able to pick, I mean, would the gravitational potential, the, the, the general relativistic potential, be probable with such an experiment? I, I love the question, and, uh, you know, we've, we've, I, I say we, my, my group and some of our collaborators have gone in that direction. I am completely unqualified to answer that question. But I would think that there's you know, something to think about there. Um, so let, let me remind everybody that uh, the discussion is now open to questions about everything that's been uh, talked about at the meeting and all the talks as well. Dan. I actually, sorry, I want to ask Mark a question. <laughs> um, I am not sure if my mind is completely blown by what you were saying or if I'm just kind of hung over. Um, <laughs> are you, this reference frame thing, so this idea that I go to the reference frame of my superposed atom and then I see the tungsten superposed in that frame, is that, is that the, what, what you guys are talking about? That, well, yeah, that was sort of where Marcus was going. And uh, I, I, I think you could do that. You could do a quantum reference frame transformation and interpret this work in that context. But then I think you have to be careful because uh, if, if you're inclined to believe that there may be a, you know, a breakdown of quantum mechanics with larger mass objects that would remove the symmetry of that transformation, then uh, you couldn't do that. So that, that's like becomes the way of saying, what, are you, what would you be testing by going to larger mass? I see, okay, good. So, so at a quantitative level, so if the atoms are superposed, you know, 50 centimeters or something, are, is the idea that in the frame, of the, the frame of the atoms, you see the tungsten superposed at that same length yeah. scale? I mean, how no, am I no, supposed I to would think just, of that? I mean, that's the simplest interpretation of what I just described is tungsten is fixed there, the atom is in its spatial superposition, and I just wanted to recollect that one way of interpreting this experiment is like, because it, it's sort of puzzling if you, if you say, oh, I have a phase shift that doesn't de de depend on forces. I, you know, the, the operational guy in me wants to know, where's that phase shift coming from? And, oh, this phase shift, it's gotta be due to energy. Where's that energy? And, uh, you know, and so then, and that's what led to the thought path of like, oh, it you know, must be the gravitational field energy by analogy with you know, ENM. And so I say, oh, you know, how do I have gravitational field energy? Let's not forget about the gravitational field of that tiny atom. So I have an atom that's carrying a gravitational field. I have a tungsten proof mass that has a gravitational field. The field energy of the pair of those, I integrate over the total field, field atom plus field tungsten, G squared, atom up, integrate over all the space, take away the, 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 the self energies, and that gives me the, the, the energy of one configuration. And then I move the atom to a different configuration space, I integrate all over all space, and I get a different energy, I subtract them, and that's the phase shift. 
That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think that I can completely follow and that? believe. Yeah, yeah, I think that's just a fact and, and mathematically. And you can say that's trivial because, of, of course, it had to be that way. But I say we're, when we're there, we're already talking about superposition of, you know, superposition of fields. I didn't mean to shut you. Do you have a? <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah, Other questions? Thank you. And I wonder whether you really need this um, viewpoint of super, uh, uh, superposed gravitational fields to explain the result. So isn't it that uh, if you just, and I think you even said this in your talk, right? Mm -hmm. If you just do the full theory of uh, uh, interferometric experiment, um, quantum interferometry with some gravitational background, which is provided by your tungsten, mm -hmm. then you will get, get the right result, right? So how, how does this tell us anything about well, superpositions uh, I, of gravitational so I missed, I, Did you say graviton or? Uh, no, no, no. no. If you um, take the usual um, description of quantum interferometry um, in a gravitational field, yeah. right, which now has not only up to second order curvature, but higher Good. curvature. Yes, excellent. You will get the right result, right, with the um, usual method. Totally, methods. yes. I yes. do not need to go and think about field energy. Yes, so, yeah. so how, if, if, if this explanation is sufficient, how can we conclude that it your experiment says something about uh, superpositions of gravitational fields. Well, so, yeah, that's, that's where you say, okay, so what's experimentally, so I just offered you an interpretation, and for me that's a satisfying interpretation, and it, it may not be so satisfying for others. I think if you wanted to back off and make an operationally minimal interpretation, you would replace field with gravitational interaction or some language like that. And then you could choose, do you want to do it in terms of potential and source masses, or do you want to do it in terms of fields? Uh, just like you can do in e &M. You know, when I talk about the energy of a configuration of charges, I can talk about that energy in terms of the energy that's in the fields, or I can talk about it of sources interacting with fields. But it, that's just, uh, you know, some flexibility we have under the, the standard physics. Uh, but, you know, what, what, what I find a, appealing about that way of looking at it is that when I, when I puzzle over you know, how, how I, I can have uh, something like the, uh, the gravitational Arnold Bohm effect. And I ask the question, like, well, just like we ask our students in intro e &M, well, if I, if I charge up a capacitor, where's the energy? We say, well, okay, the energy's in the field. And so I find it appealing to say that, okay? It, it, but it's, I'm not proving anything. Now, where, does, where can we start proving things? You have to additional experiment, like that experiment we did where we changed the uh, relative uh, probability amplitude in the interferometer arms. That rules out theories that want to project a semi-classical field for the atom. Because if, if, the, if the field produced by the atom depends on the probability amplitudes, it, that's semi-classical theories will do that, then that will, that will change what I see in the output of the experiment. So that, that's something that's ex, you know, experimental that I, that I can talk about. And then in terms of this Let's talk about supervision of fields. That's just, I think it's ultimately a question of taste. Uh, okay, and uh, you were mentioning at the end of your talk uh, the question, um, what the difference between uh, superposed gravitational fields and um, the creation of entanglement by, um, what, what we gain additionally when we observe creation of entanglement by uh, uh, gravitation, right? And I would, suspect that the difference is in the question with, uh, that if you can create entanglement, then it stops to be a question of taste, whether you talk about uh, gravitation classically or in terms of superposed yeah. fields. So <laughs> what, what I, we could say, you know, what, what has been tested here for, quote, the first time is that we have not seen a situation, and I would say in experimental physics, where we have uh, explored with a quantum system an inhomogeneous gravitational field. How does an inhomogeneous field couple to a quantum system? It's something that's 
our first year graduate students can write down in Schrodinger equation, <laughs> and maybe it's uninteresting, but from the point of view of experimental foundations, that's something that should be tested. Especially sure, in the, the experiment is amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's my perspective. <laughs> Thank you for those questions.